today I am with uh, Greg Puy. Hi, Greg. Hi. He's the host of the French uh, podcast Vlan, and we are going to interview Jason Silva. Hello, Jason. Hello. So Jason explores uh, modernity and technology and how it both benefits and disrupts humanity. The pressure of this can impact our mental health, but it turns out moving past our comfort zone is cognitively beneficial. Blowing a mind boosts cognitive flexibility. It does. It does. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you explain us how exactly. Sure. <laughs> My first question is, at a time where we feel like so close to lose control of our, um, our technology mm. with AI and uh, other things, uh, what's making you an optimist still? Yeah. Thank you for the question. And thank you both uh, for having me in this thank you. hybrid <laughs> podcast conversation. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I am, I feel a lot of resonance with Uh, the words of Kevin Kelly. So Kevin Kelly is the founding, one of the co-founders of Wired magazine. He's considered a technology maverick and futurist. And he uses the, the word or the term protopian to, to, to when discussing like his views of the future, his orientation. So it, it's not the same as being a utopian, you know, a utopian optimist that just assumes everything will be fine or a dystopian that has just succumbed to doom and gloom and fatalism. But a protopian believes that, hey, man, we may be flawed, stumbling primates, but when we work together, we are primates that can fly. So no doubt we're at a inflection point, a kind of intelligence explosion when it comes to things like artificial intelligence. I've been lecturing about exponential technologies for 10 years, so I, I feel like I've been talking about this for a long time so i'm not not really that surprised that that the world is finally waking up to the pace of change the pace of innovation and there are some legitimate concerns no doubt when it comes to ai could go off the rails you know it could be <laughs> weaponized it could play out in ways that we can't even predict you know the so-called unknown unknown uh but at the same time like i mean look how far we've come Look how fast we've gotten here. Like we were crawling the savannas of Africa and now we're like building space telescopes that can peer into the Big Bang. You know, I can call my mother with a device that Amber Case calls a techno-social wormhole <laughs> opener. You know, the smartphone like just opens up a techno-social wormhole whereby space and time and geography collapse And I can see another person and talk to another person across oceans, across continents. So I see technology all around me that, as Arthur C. Clarke said, is indistinguishable from magic. So creatures that engender things indistinguishable from magic can get their act together if they need to and if they want to. So, and the protopian view, I believe, is exactly that. It says, hey, man, if we get our act together, uh, we have within us the capacity to you know, as, as Stuart Brand said, we are as gods and might as well get good at it. So, I, you know, it, it's not saying, there's no guarantee, I suppose, right? But my intuition and my feeling, and I suppose my faith lies in us, in this being our finest hour, in us rising to the occasion. But at the same time, I mean, you cannot ignore that um, we live in a very individualistic uh, society. And uh, this goes... I totally agree with you. I mean, uh, humans are stronger because they go together and because yeah. of language and all those things. Yeah. But at the same time, since uh, the Enlightenment period, we are we are very much into into this individualistic. Uh, and I, and I, when I listen to um, talk like uh, Tristan Harris on on uh, yeah. on AI, people are listening, and yet they are wondering, yes, but how can I take advantage myself of AI? So they are listening to Tristan saying, oh yeah, AI is super dangerous. And at the same time, wondering how they can take advantage of it because they, they don't want to be last. So, you know, the struggle and that that's to me is the issue. A absolutely. And, you know, it's nothing new under the sun that technology is and has always been a double-edged sword. Mm. And so... The alphabet, how wonderful this tool to encode human knowledge, to allow us to communicate, and you can weaponize language. Writing, same thing. 
the printing press, how liberating, Everything. but also hate speech propaganda can really propagate itself through the printing press. Same with social media. Without social media, I know that my career wouldn't really have been possible and the hearts and minds that I touch through my work that thank me for the ways in which my work has served their life wouldn't be possible for that, were it not for that medium, for that technology. But we've, we've seen the weaponization of social media. We've seen what it did to the United States in the elections. We, we've seen how it was used, Cambridge Analytica. We've seen what happened with Brexit. I mean, incredibly problematic stuff. And I guess that's just the story of man, unfortunately. The story of humanity is, in some ways, we are Promethean beings and we steal fire from the gods, but perhaps we got ahead of ourselves. We didn't have the, the wisdom and the prudence, as Daniel Schmachtenberger said, um, to, to, to utilize, to deploy these tools in the best of ways. We sort of just deploy them and the use cases happen and some are good and some are bad. And maybe we need to get ahead of that before the tools are world shaking and world destroying tools. Who should be the wise men we're trusting? Yeah, good question. In terms of like who do we listen to is, is probably the, the toughest question of all. And I talk about this as well, that human beings are, well, we're storytelling animals and, 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 and our, our compass, our, 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 the way we orient ourselves, the way we orient our behavior, the thing that tells us how to act in the world is, is, is a storytelling structure. You know, like, like it seems to be like the, the, at, at the very bottom of consciousness is story you know meaning is extracted from story and so and so and so these narratives these stories they they sustain us or they can destroy us you know there's nothing more tragic but also fascinating about uh somebody who chooses to take their own life especially in the western world where we have secured such material prosperity such material wealth something that our ancestors would have like dreamed about you know cell phone internet communication whatever cable television And that today more people die by suicide than die from natural disasters and armed conflict combined. Well, suicide is a crisis of storytelling, in my opinion. When the story you tell yourself about yourself is no longer convincing. When the narrative that sustains your life, when the narrative that gives your life meaning collapses or gets inverted or gets corrupted like a software file. Well, if you don't have a story, you can't live. You know, man can live a few you know, weeks without food, a few days without water, but not for a minute without hope not for a minute without a sustaining narrative. And so the narrative matters. Jamie Wheel during the Harvest Conference talks about when people come together and are, and, and are, and are like jolted into aliveness by something called soul force. It's the thing that wakes us up, you know, this affirmation of life in spite of its tragedy. And he cites people like Martin Luther King, you know, potentially Nelson Mandela. And these are people who in the end were orators. I think about Barack Obama, you know, the best story wins and the best storyteller in a way casts a spell upon his or her audience. And so it's a great question. And, you know, I'm a I love I love language. I love literature. And I love poetry, and so I want the, the the best storyteller or the storyteller that wins to be a very literate one. I want I want <laughs> I want a, 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 just an inspirational voice that becomes the voice we you know that we all orient our lives around. But I don't want it to be an ideological voice. I don't want it to be a populist voice. I don't want it to be a voice that separates us, that casts us into a world of us versus them. I want a unifying voice that sees the other as oneself and that at the same time celebrates our differences. And so that requires a different kind of thinking. You know, somebody informed by the overview effect, somebody informed by psychedelic egoless rapture, somebody who's been moved by song, you know. I, I mean, I, it's a big thing that I'm looking, you know, to, for, for, the, for the person to, to be the storyteller of our times. You know, the people I tend to respect the most are filmmakers, because I think they tell the best stories. They tell the best stories through modern myths, which I think films are. Christopher Nolan, for example, his new film that he's making about, you know, Oppenheimer, I Am Become Death, you know, about the invention of the atomic bomb. I probably feel there's probably more, more, more relevance in this new film. I haven't seen it yet, but more relevance in this new film now as we face all these cataclysmic potential, you know, runaway effects with our technology to watch a film about what happened You know, when we, when we really started to play God and discover atomic power, 
Um, so again, long winded answer, but I think it's, it's storytellers, the right storytellers. I'm very interested because you talk about movies and I'm a strong believer in um, uh, sociology of imagination, sociology of, imagi of the imaginary. And uh, actually I believe we all live in imagination. So all we live in are common or shared imagination somehow. And those imagination or common imagination are stories, I agree sure. with you, that we tell ourselves, tell in the story, in the, in the families, in the countries, but they are coming a lot through uh, movies, advertising, radio, uh, songs, books. Um, and when I see uh, the movie industry, which for the Occidental world at least is made in uh, Hollywood, mm -hmm. it's a lot about dystopian stories. Mm -hmm. They don't really make uh, like happy stories of technology. They don't really make happy stories of climate change. Yeah. They only talk about uh, disasters. Yeah. Because that's what sells. People want to be afraid because they want to get prepared. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the issue that I see is that if they were going to tell good stories, people will not come to the uh, movies to see them. And so they have to tell bad stories for the people to come and make money. I hear what and, you're you saying. Know? I hear what you're saying. But I, I think, and this is something Jamie Wheel also talked about in the conference, is that the best stories are actually the ones that initially are pre-tragic then they're tragic and then the post-tragedy <laughs> is the triumph in the end which is also the hero's journey that the mythologist joseph totally. campbell famously isolated as a meta pattern that played <laughs> out in every effective story and i yeah. think it's because conflict leads to action action becomes a measure of our character a measure of our courage do we rise to the occasion do we show up do we grow up when we need to before everything is going to go to hell and so <laughs> And so in some ways, I think it's okay for cinema to be a place where we can imagine a, a, a rehearsal of these scenarios. We, we can play them out. I mean, isn't it better for these tragedies to play out cinematically and then for us to come together in the end to save the day? These are, in some ways, maybe it's it's like dreams. When we're, when we're dreaming, why do we have often nightmares and challenging dreams? We're working it out. We're playing things out. The mind is rehearsing scenarios and playing them out. And that's then true. that's, in some ways, who knows, downloaded somatically into our, <laughs> into our instinctual body. But, um, but yeah, you know, I, I, still, I still think that even, even when a film explores darkness or the shadow, it does so in a way that can be cathartic and bring us back to the light, you know. And, and I, I am biased because I, I, I love cinema. Um, and I'm sure people could argue, you know, a different perspective. But Is it why, in a way, you made, like, short videos about yeah. science? Because yeah. it's better, easier to explain science in short videos and to make a big movie? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I went to film school and I double majored in philosophy and film. And the reason that I ended up falling into the short form storytelling or the short films, as I call them, that I, that I narrate, is because in some ways, like, uh, I realized that what was happening with online distribution of content and online video is that people were consuming uh, this media in a different way. So while a film length, a traditional film length works, you know, in a dark room when people are sitting quietly on a big screen, or maybe even at home on a big screen. When people are watching content on their phones or on their computer in between multitasking, like you really only have them for a minute, for better or worse, you know. There's a lot of benefits, but also a lot of consequences to the, 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 just the amount of information, inputs that people are receiving. And so I just kind of felt, well, I have maybe a minute, two, three minutes, four minutes to, to, to see if I can get in there, to see if I can, you know, jolt a person into into paying attention, into learning something. And it just so happens also that like in conversation, sometimes the greatest downloads, you know, might be like a three minute stream of consciousness that emerges mid conversation. Boom. So that's my video. Like my video is that it's like, it's like, it's an aha moment or a, a moment of, 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 of reconciling opposites, you know, like you have a thesis, you have antithesis, and then you have synthesis. I try to make my videos to be like that moment, the, the, the synthesis of an idea, the realization of an aha, and capture that as like a little video pill. And you can teach some somebody a concept or an idea in, in three to five minutes. I really think you can, in a filmic way, in an emotional way. Yeah. What is your process to, to do those videos? Do you prepare? Do you write something down that you learn by heart? How, how do no. you do it? Yeah, good question. So it's funny because... Create, creative people, 
uh, are always interested in like how to become more creative. Oh, yeah. And in the, the the marketplace for creativity is huge. There's a lot of consumerism around creative enterprising. How do I become more creative? What are the <laughs> steps to becoming more creative? But I, I remember reading an article once that, that really resonated with my process, which was about like the key to creativity is mood regulation, you know? So it's not like how do I become more creative? It's how do I become more joyful? How do I become more awake? How do I become more in tune? You know, mood regulation, for me at least, seems to be the key to creative outbursts. And so rather than plan what I'm going to talk about in a video, I make sure that I get a really good sleep <laughs> and I plan the environment where I'm going to be. And I try to design a place that will inform a state of being that will give rise to a reflection shaped by that state of being. And so my videos in some ways are trip reports. They are like direct reflections of something that happened in the moment. That's why they're so of the moment. They're so real. They're so authentic because you can't plan something like that. It's impossible. All you can do is set the stage and take a leap of faith. What about boredom? Because boredom is, is a huge part of uh, creativity also. Yeah, funny you say that. There's a great essay written by a guy called uh, Henry Weismeyer about the age of, he says, uh, the search for awe or the age of awe in the age of, uh, sorry, the search for awe in the age of awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and one of the things that he said was that experience is the new faith and we are refugees from the mundane. So we are running away from habituation. We are running away from boredom. You know, boredom is that feeling of low affect, mm -hmm. low engagement, low salience. And typically, I only experience boredom when I haven't slept. It's really the only time that I'm, that I'm bored, if I'm under-rested. If I had a really good sleep, I can pretty much beam my attention. I have the resources to beam my attention towards anything. And anything that you bring a certain quality of attention to becomes fascinating, you know? So, but yes, I mean, you have to seek novelty for sure. And now, gra now granted, frustration and boredom, yes, that can lead to creative births. Usually if there is boredom or any kind of frustration for me, It just makes me double down on making sure that tonight I get a really good sleep and tomorrow I go somewhere new and beautiful with a friend and get into it, you know, and wake up from that. Mm -hmm. So so it ends up definitely being a, it lights a fire under your ass. Like if I'm bored today, <laughs> I do not want to be bored again tomorrow. That's good. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Because you were talking about uh, creativity yeah. and we were talking before about technology, I was... Uh, wondering um, exactly what's the part also of um, how technology inspires your uh, creativity. Sure. You, went, you did like a video that went on with AI that went yeah. viral. Yeah. Um, so what are the tools you're using? Sure. When do you notice a technology and say, oh, I'm going to use it? And yeah. uh, well, I think the first one that really got me excited was a uh, eight millimeter camcorder back in 1994, <laughs> you know, like all of a sudden you could make movies with like the little video cassettes yeah. and it was a, for consumers, not a professional film camera, but just a handheld camcorder. And my mom bought me one, it cost her a thousand dollars, like hey. 1994. Wow. And she was very generous, but she knew I loved movies. And she was like, you're going to use this for a creative. And I started making videos with my brother. I could make movies, you know, and that was like 94. Who knows? I was 12, you know, and by the time I was like 14 or 16, I was making videos with my friends, interviewing each other about ideas. I was in love. And then I bought a dual deck VCR, which means I could transfer the footage from an eight millimeter tape to a VHS and I could oh, dub in yeah, music yeah, yeah. in the transfer. <laughs> so without having any digital tools, I could still add music to my videos. So that That was like a creative use of technology. I can make these music videos, edit them in my head, shoot them in sequence, and then just dub the music afterwards. And I was like, <laughs> I have a music video. That was very exciting. And and then and then, in some ways, I I I anticipated that these video cameras would get more and more sophisticated. 
I never quite anticipated that they would merge with an internet-enabled device, like a camera on a smartphone. Mm. But I already had a fantasy that a camera that fit in my hands, I could travel around the world, get inspired on the top of a mountain in Iceland and record a reflection about it. But then with things like the iPhone, my dream was literalized because now I could hold this device. You know, I was making selfie videos before word the word selfie became the word <laughs> of the year. Like, I was very ahead of my time in that sense, you know. Um, but uh, but I've always creatively used these tools to up the ante of the cinematic power of my media. Um, and then the latest iteration of this now is is working with some of AI powered visualizations. So part of what I try to do in my videos is I want to bring people into the ineffable spaces of my inner world, the imagination, you know, which has its own dream logic. You know, it's like a dream. You can imagine the future and the past. You can imagine things that don't exist. You can hybridize things that don't exist with things that do exist, like all of that. And when you want to visualize that, there's traditional editing, you know, you source some stock footage, you cut away to imagery that's literally or metaphorically connected to what I'm talking about. And you can put people in, in a kind of trance, in a kind of dream. But now I can actually generate original imagery generated by AI powered algorithms in combination with specific verbal prompts mm -hmm. and run it through a rendering engine that will then bring original like like liquid imagination rendering my thoughts visually around me in a way that is truly a kind of psychedelic experience. And I did a video about the power of AI art using this AI art, you know, and, it, and it's just insanely creative in my opinion. I've never <laughs> seen anything like it, even though I, I did it. And uh, yeah, it's always just seeing like, what is the new thing and how can I use it to augment the storytelling? Because it's still about the story. So do you think uh, artists should or must use AI uh, to be, um, not hub, but to, to, to continue with the time? Like uh, like you could tell, like uh, a writer should work with a computer or um, a painter should work with uh, Photoshop or whatever. Uh, I think I think should or must are strong words. Uh, I, think they, I think if they, I think if you, you know, I, I think some people still love vinyl records, and that's beautiful. And I'm sure that there would be a premium placed on analog technologies for Probably. sure. But I think I think if you're inspired to pick up a new tool, like you know, Kevin Kelly likes to say, imagine how impoverished all of us would be if the technology of oil painting didn't arrive in time for Van Gogh or the technology of the musical instrument didn't arrive in time for Beethoven. So, like, these technologies, they increase our possibility space. And I don't know who or what form of genius or a unique combination of person and tool will manifest, but I know that beautiful things will be created that we can scarcely imagine and it would be a loss for that not to happen if those tools were not there which one would you uh, dream to happen as a filmmaker oh my goodness um you know what would be kind of amazing would be you know fully immersive virtual reality And I'm talking about something indistinguishable from like embodied experience of the world, like like Neo in the Matrix, you know. But instead of <laughs> instead of seeing that as a, as a prison, I sort of see that as a kind of psychedelic liberation, you know. Oh, I just wow. imagine us like being able to like experience like flying, you know, like like combining skinny dipping and flying through the sky, you know, in this virtual reality world, you know, where we can witness like star systems and black holes and wormholes all around. I mean, it'd just be really cool to swim inside of like this kind of cinematic universe that's fully fully 3D and and, and fully surrounding us. I've, I've always dreamed about fully immersive virtual reality. Like I want to go into the screen. That's making me think of a Steven Spielberg movie, uh, yeah. Ready Player Ready One. Ready Player One, for sure. We're still waiting. And what does it mean for you, radical hope? How do you explain it? Yeah, I love the term radical hope. And I think radical hope is what happens after radical healing and radical wonder and radical technology. That was the my thesis in my talk right. okay. that I gave today, which was, you know, how do I get there? You know, because hope is one thing, but radical hope means, man, I'm leaping into this open-eyed, I believe, I trust. It's a trust fall. But the only way that I could trust fall without shitting my pants 
is if I've healed my fractures, schisms, fears, and traumas, you know, and if I've returned to a kind of wholeness that then connects me to the holy, you know, that place of radical wonder to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, infinity in the palms of your hand and eternity in an hour. Like, I want to go full on William Blake, you know, <laughs> so first heal myself, then go full on William Blake, radical healing, radical wonder, then radical technology, because then I'm now imagining the impossible dream and I'm imagineering the impossible dream. So I'm putting it into action. I'm making it so, um, and then after, I mean, the coupling of those things, healing, wonder, technology, takes me to a place of not just hope, but knowing. You know, catalepsis, the truth from which nothing can dislodge you. <laughs> um, that, that, that's that's the, the, my formula for radical hope. So it takes a lot of wisdom to do that. Mm. And I, I was, it's, it's a basic question I'm going to ask, but how do you take that at scale? Because yeah. how do you make sure? Because you were talking, uh, we, we started with the, the politicians yeah. and those guys are not there at all. Like, no, no, <laughs> not at all. They're depressing. Yeah, they're very depressing. Every oh, country, it's depressing. not yeah. American, it's not European, it's pretty much everywhere. I know. So how do you take that at scale? How do you I make know. sure people are into that uh, wisdom, yeah. especially the people leading us somehow? It's interesting you say that. And uh, you remember Vaclav Havel? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the Rose Revolution, was it, or something, in the Czech Republic? But yeah. wasn't he a poet before he became president? That I don't know. I think he was some kind of an artist or something. But, like, I think the, the romantic dream is, I guess, we need our leadership to come out of the arts. And I'm not saying actors, because politicians are like actors. Or comics, if you think about. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> I, but I want, but more artists. More poets, All right. more of these kinds of thinkers in positions of power would be very interesting to me. Because I agree, the thing that makes me most cynical in the world are politicians. Ego-driven, narcissists, short-sighted, mm -hmm. just not very inspiring. Obama was inspiring to me. He seemed like a really wise man. True. Um, he seemed like an artistic thinker. But, you know, his hands or somewhat tied. Mm -hmm. suppose that sometimes happens in a place with, that has a balance of power. Um, not inspired by anybody I see these days very much. And, 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 but I like to think that, that even though they're in power, there's other kinds of power that shapes the world too. I think technologists are able to shape the world more than politicians in True. some ways. Politicians are there hopefully to prevent us from initiating physical force against others, although they don't do a very good job of that. But no. again, that's the whole thing. Like they have the guns and they make sure that we don't shoot each other and they make sure that people don't shoot airplanes from the sky and do that. And then let the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the technologists, the poets and the artists through their soft power, you know, steer us forward. But when you look at uh, Elon Musk and what he's doing with Twitter and what he's doing yeah. uh, overall, yeah. his plan is uh, let's go to Mars, which we, I mean, I don't see that coming uh, yeah. you know, in my lifetime anyway. Yeah. Um, so this is not a solution uh, and he's one of the leading technologists and somehow... I mean, I think you can debate some of what he speaks about, but he did make rockets that land themselves. That's true. <laughs> like, rockets are cool because they explosively fire us into the at beyond the atmosphere, but he made rockets that then land themselves afterwards. Talk about a circular technology. So, you know, from an engineering standpoint, he's already achieved the impossible many times over. Tesla's cars are astonishing to drive in. I think... You know, maybe he likes Twitter more than me, and maybe that sometimes <laughs> triggers him to saying things that don't seem to be at the level of who he is when he's making things like rockets that land themselves. Um, I think what he wants to do with Mars is also just, it's a very, uh, sometimes you have to do things that are also symbolic, not just practical. And uh, even though it's both, it's symbolic. We go multi-planetary, that's symbolic. It's also practical, it's an insurance. If we fuck it up here, like we'll have a presence over there. So I still, I still, I, I, su I support that idea. You know, I am persuaded by the idea that we should expand beyond a single planet. Yeah, I'd love to jam with him. I really would. <laughs>
what if we keep talking about uh, transformation uh, what is the most transformed human you can picture in a uh, mid there what is the most transformed human yes. like like my version of the yeah. the overman or the vitruvian yes. man i think it's some kind of uh like a philosopher king or philosopher queen, you know, like it, it, I think it's a, a, a man or a woman of letters, somebody who, who, whose inner life has been richly informed by literature and philosophy and contemplation. Like I want, I want somebody of depth and emotion, um, but somebody who also understands, you know, mathematics and physics and engineering and chemistry, you know, like sees how things click and work together. You know, I'm, I think of people like, Richard Feynman, or people like Carl Sagan. You know, when Carl Sagan talks, I'm like, he's pure awe, and he's an astrophysicist. He's both a poet and a scientist. You know, yeah. um, I think directors that make movies. You know, how do you do that? How do you tell a story? How do you explain complex ideas, whether they're humanistic or technological? And then how do you communicate them in a way that such a reflection of our own interiority how do you tell a story that is both specific and archetypal you know universal and specific i mean uh, yeah so i i kind of see it as a the, the the new renaissance man you know is has a hat tip to the old men of letters you know um with their commonplace notebooks you know but you don't talk about augmented people About yeah, who? Augment, augmented, augmented people. Ah, interesting, interesting. Well, What do you I think, think about that? Well, I think all of us are augmented. I think when I put an iPhone in my pocket, I'm augmented. I think That's when I, true. somebody who puts on reading glasses is augmented. Um, I think I think our clothing are an example of augmentation. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think we're all augmented humans. So I think maybe you're talking about more 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 novel examples like like the colorblind guy that put an antenna directly to his skull and with bone well, conduction no, he, can, I'm, I'm really he can hear colors I'm re to come back yeah. to movies i was thinking uh, what this movie is called you know when uh, you implant uh, a chip in the brain and some people refuse to do it you know you, you know the movie i'm talking about oh. it's a very old movie from uh, i guess the 90s welcome to gataka yeah welcome yeah. to gataka Um, Interest, interesting, and uh, th that is that's what I was referring to. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that uh, once something crosses the threshold of the skin bag, it's a whole other can of worms. You know, having something in the pocket of your jeans is different than having something under your skin. But yes. hey, man, there's people who transform their skin with tattoos. There's people who put implants under their skin. Because they want to metamorphosize into something else. I mean, oh, self-determination is huge. And in some ways, human beings are creatures of symbolic inner life and an external physical embodiment. If you're lucky enough that there's congruence between who you are on the inside or how you see yourself on the inside versus what you see on the mirror, good for you. But there's a lot of people who, who they are, who they really are on the inside, they're Their imaginal, their avatar, their essential self does not correspond to what they see in the mirror. And so they want to transform that. And, and that can be manifest in a thousand different ways. Tattoos, adornment, plastic surgery, right? Like it can be all kinds of things. And with biotechnology, it's going to be a whole new kind of uh, capacity to intervene. Transhumanism will become, hey, man, I want to grow a third eye on my forehead just because I want to. That's cool. Want to grow a tail? That's cool. You know, want to augment your hearing? That's cool. Whatever it is, I think we need to respect self-determination and we need to, I think we need to respect that some of us have moved way past the traditional binary physical, you know, representation of the human. They want to turn themselves into something more fluid, more expansive, and more of their own choosing. Mm. But we we already do that. I mean, with um, with glucose spike, we know you, you can have a chip yeah. that tells you um, what your glucose level is. Yeah. But would you would you put a chip in your children's brain, for example, if it was safe? For sure, you would. I mean, if there was a safe medical device that went under the skin and checked all of their vitamin levels, their fluids, their heart rate, something that could predict a problem months before it became a problem. And it was like as safe as like uh, an established vaccine and it's something that you get when you're little. Yeah, for sure. I would have no problem with that. I don't have a moral issue with that. 
No, but you wouldn't be scared of uh, hacking, for example. That uh, oh, for sure. I mean, that's why. I, that's why children. Then yeah. Well, that's why I said if it's safe. It's a bit safe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like yes. I mean, yeah. I think. Uh, Is it Yaval Harari who talks about the dangers of hacking humans? But you don't need to put a chip in a human to hack them. The That's right true. feedback loops will hack them. You know, <laughs> put the right algorithms on the right social media platform, and a person that has low discipline and a poor information diet can be easily hacked. Yeah. So people can be hacked even by orators. I mean, Hitler hacked the brains of the brain stems of those feral audience members that would listen to his vitriolic hate speech. You know. Is a sense of oh, do I say yes. it right? Yeah, beautiful, is a <laughs> <laughs> we had <laughs> a challenge. On <laughs> so beautiful. Is like a um, new spirituality. For me, it is. I think that when I experience awe and wonder, it sounds a lot like a spiritual experience. You know, I, I don't use the word spiritual that much because I think it's been corrupted by misuse, by ide ideologues, mm -hmm. and 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 forcing people into certain scriptures that maybe don't speak to them and so on and so forth and this is the spiritual path that you must follow and so on and so forth and I'm not I'm not into that but but I am into experiences that are sensorially immersive and that arrest the mind's attention and that in some sense exceed our maps so we all create maps to orient ourselves in the world that's just called growing up from a child to an adult and then as an adult you kind of live inside your maps semi-autopilot you know occasionally something doesn't fit in your maps and you encounter that thing and you pause for a moment and you're like okay i noticed that and then you quickly incorporate it into your maps your updated maps and you move on but sometimes you encounter a self-transforming machine elf <laughs> in the middle of a dmt trip or an art piece at burning man the point is Or the Grand Canyon, or the birth of a child, or an orgasm with a woman that takes your breath away. The point is you can encounter things that are beyond what you might have ever imagined. And that opens up a space of obliteration of your maps and a place of virginal noticing. And that's awe. And it turns out that awe doesn't just feel good, it leaves an afterglow. Like it's like a medicine that has an effect. And the effect is increased compassion, increased well-being, increased humil humility, and it has uh, an, uh, anti-inflammatory properties. Mm -hmm. wow. So it's like wow. good for at an organismic level, <laughs> blowing your own <laughs> minds is good for you. Yeah, and how do you cultivate this sense of, oh, like when you have a, when you're in a bad mood, depressed? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. Good sleep, nature, and cannabis. That's my formula, and I live in a place where cannabis is legal, FYI. <laughs> but uh, but um, you know you know I think I think people can get there through a variety of ways. Novelty is a pretty great trigger. You know, again, something you haven't seen before fires up the dopamine, it boosts salience, it boosts engagement. You're more present. Um, novelty is good. Arousal is good. Um, contemplation, meditation, all these things are good. Lubrication. That's what cannabis does in a way. <laughs> it just, it just, for me at least, it uh, floods my mind with heightened noticing. Yeah, I wanted to know how you look at death as a philosopher. I'm, I'm not a fan. <laughs> 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 well, no, I li I think that that I think that psychological death i.e. the death of our fears, the death of our traumas, the death of our rumination, the death of our locked in thought patterns that no longer serve us, the death of the ego. All of these are healthy, psychological, renewing practices. But that's very different than the withering away of your vitality, the rotting away of your flesh, the failure of your organs, and the loss of everyone you love. Now, if we are, in fact, eternal, If some kind of awareness persists, then hallelujah and amen and great. But if not, it's a tragedy. And yet, uh, death gives the essence of uh, the beauty of life because... Some people say that. I, I'm, I'm saying that. <laughs> 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 I mean, at least I feel like if you were eternal and if you've seen Islander to go back to the movie thing... Um, It's kind of it's kind of sad, especially in the in the in the world where everybody cannot uh, be eternal. But when you're eternal, nothing really matters. You know, you don't have any joy because well, you know, you, you need contrast. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, look, I definitely, I hear what you're saying. But, you know, I used to tell my mom, oh, I'm bored. And she's like, only boring people are boring. <laughs> and I kind of feel like if you need death for life to be exciting, something's wrong with you. <laughs> life itself is what gives meaning to life. And uh-huh. I don't need to be put to death, <laughs> to be handed a death sentence for me to come into aliveness. I, I just know. need some I, cannabis, bro. I, I don't really have a choice. I mean, I was born... With this death sentence on my head. I know. I know. <laughs> so it's not that I choose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I feel you. I feel you. It's very funny what you said about boredom. It interested me because, Greg, maybe you're French as me. And I think my mother always told me, like, it's a good thing to be bored and that you should cultivate also as a child. I've heard and that. you understand that? Yeah? No? I mean, no, no. I, I've heard it. Yeah. Because, yeah. because, because it can be a motivator. To leave that negative affect of boredom can fuel you into not boredom. Oh no, it's creative. Uh, your your mind will take you somewhere, not to be bored. Sure. So you will help yourself. Sure. Why? Sure, sure, sure. It's it's like taking away someone's chocolate to make them appreciate chocolate. I understand. <laughs> But uh, I I mean somehow it's true. I mean uh, it can be true for some people, not for me. Not for you. Okay. <laughs> so so in your in your point of view. Um, Because I'm always thinking about scaling, like uh, people, like uh, we're eight billions. How do you, again? How do you scale? Like you said, um, one way would be to have a poet philosopher at the head of state. So that that's one thing, and uh, bringing new stories, tell, new storytelling, new yeah. stories. But um, how how do you scale? Because I think like people are so disconnected to who they are. They are disconnected yeah. to nature. They're disconnected yeah. somehow. Yeah, and also because you were talking about um, moral and you know the patterns, uh, yeah, uh, something that we don't learn and actually we we applaud is uh, the white collar being uh, bad to people, like uh, earning whatever millions uh, dollars over pe- other people' life. It's uh, concrete. Oh wow, you made uh, 10 millions or whatever millions. We, we congratulate you and we don't say, oh, but what about the people that you are earning this money on? And that create this, this difference creates a, 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 a huge impact on the average people's life. And so for, for a weird reason, I think we, we celebrate that, um, that thing or, and we, we say, okay, you should not beat someone, you should not rape, da, 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 which is obviously uh, better. But we don't say, oh, you should not uh, be mean to other people with, you know, uh, this uh, very, very, uh, uh, I would just put that, uh, unequal system. Uh, we, we actually congratulate you for doing it. For being really successful, you mean? Yeah. I mean, what we call success yeah. is accumulation in our society. Sure, sure. Well, look, I'm not opposed to people being rewarded for exceptional contributions. Sure. So, made an iPhone and a lot of people bought it. You deserve to have enough money to buy a big mansion if you want. You know, like <laughs> all good. Um, and I like that, you know, wonderful actors and directors are all extremely wealthy. They deserve it. What they do is the Lord's work, in my opinion. The problem with extreme inequality is when you get to levels of disparity where those at the bottom are inhumanely pushed into a state of economic stress that no person in the 21st century should be experiencing. We have enough technology, innovation, we have enough resources that... You know, if we figured things out, things could be much better. It's a reason I'm very inspired by countries in Northern Europe. I live in Amsterdam. I love the Netherlands. I love Denmark. I love, you know, places like Sweden and Norway. These places are much more egalitarian. But they're not like Cuban communist. You know, they're not Soviet no, no, Union. No, totally. They are free enterprise. They have rule of law. People can acquire property and be successful. But, you know, you high trust governments more taxes that you see the results of those taxes in the public square, in the social services, in the health care. Mm. And so you still have some people that are richer than others, but it's just, it's not so extreme to be inhumane. It's not the billionaire and the homeless tent encampment, you know? Mm-hmm. I think that's where it gets absurd. 
Yeah, I feel very French asking that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm asking uh, one question to uh, all the guests of the podcast uh, Harvest okay. Series. Oh. If there is one thing that gives you hope, what is it? A nice smile, unexpectedly. A beautiful song that gives me the goosebumps that's not on my playlist, that I just heard it randomly because a friend played it, and I'm like, wow a new expression of beauty that I didn't anticipate. Um, stumbling upon a film trailer that I feel like is, this film is going to change my life. I know it already. And yesterday I didn't know about this film, and now I do. Um, when my dad sends me pictures of him hiking Mallorca, and I'm like, wow, my dad's 75, and he's hiking mountains and living with extreme vitality and presence. He's not going quietly into that good night. He's raging against the dying of the of dying of the light with with passion and, and fitness and vitality. So there are examples everywhere. You know, anytime that the good, the true, and the beautiful reveals itself, I feel hope. My last question would be, the, the name of the podcast is Vlon. So it means uh, slamming the door to. And I was wondering, what would you open or slam the door to? Or slam and open, just yeah. open or just slam yeah. up to you? Well, very personally, um, my biggest battle has been my battle against anxiety, you know. Um, in Venezuela, you know, I was always scared of home invasions, kidnappings. My dad was once kidnapped, you know, like break into the house, that kind of stuff. So I was always afraid of, for my own safety. And, and it got in my skin, man. Like even after I left Venezuela, you know, I'll be in a movie theater in the U.S. and I'll be like, what if somebody comes in here with a gun and shoots everyone? Like I, wor I, I, I have those thoughts, Wow. that's going to ruin my fun. I'm watching a movie, having a religious experience, and some son of a bitch is going to come here with a gun and end it all. Fuck that. So anxiety has been a problem for me. So if I could shut the door on one thing at this point in my life, at least, firstly, I live in a country with no guns, but <laughs> I would shut the door on somatic anxiety, which is like the, the tendency to the catastrophize the feeling of just unease in the body that comes in for no reason when the turbulence on the plane. I would like to shut the door on that. <laughs> wow. And, uh, and I would like to open the door to radical bliss as like my new normal, mm. you know, as, as to make that my default. Thank you. Jason. Thank you. Thank you.